I'm very thankful uh, last week, uh, my wife and I, we were able to celebrate our 20 year anniversary. And so uh, we were able to get away for a little bit. I know Pastor Josh, you know, brought the message and uh, really challenged us in regards to what membership uh, truly is. And so um, I'm, I'm just excited today to preach about now church discipline, church discipline. And so the title of today's message is How to Love. How to Love. Let us pray. What a tremendous opportunity, Lord, that you have given us this day to learn how to love. Help us, O oh Lord, in the moments, Father, in which we don't feel like confronting, when we don't feel like things are so nice, when we don't feel like things are so kind that we would abandon, O oh Lord, what it is that we think is right for what is right. Grant us, O oh Lord, wisdom to understand the process of discipleship. Grant us, Lord, insight to see, Father, what we have been overlooking or what we have been undermining. Help us, O oh Lord, that even in our own lives, there is discipline, Father, in how it is that we are dealing with the sin in our own lives and to remember your restorative grace. Father, we thank you. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How to love. I can remember there was a moment in which my son was getting ready to perform at his school, Folklotico. He loves his little dance, puts his hat on, everything. And as we were getting prepared, the MC was instructing the crowd on what was getting ready to occur. And then it happened. You know what it is. A kid runs out. This MC, she's trying to Say face. But the kid is loud. The kid is interrupting. And nobody came out to get that kid. See, Vivian's already shaking her head like, mm, better snatch that kid up. <laughs> and the whole time, the MC is flustered by this little kid. There's over 400 people that are there. And the mom is just watching, doing nothing. I know what we're thinking, go get your kid. There are a shortage of teachers in all of America. Why? Because of the same reason. You didn't get your kid. And so now, private moments in which discipline should have occurred are now public. And so teachers are literally fearing for their lives because children have grown to be disrespectful, dishonorable, nasty in their predisposition towards teachers and authority because they don't want to be held accountable. So we see that when there is a lack of discipline privately, it will show itself publicly at some time. We see this happen in the church, whether it's a Catholic church or whether it's a Protestant church. That there is egregious sin happening at the highest level. There's sexual abuse. There's molestation, and you see what I see. Pastors just get moved to another church. Priests just get moved to another church, and the congregation feels hopeless. And the fact that who is going to stand for justice and do the right things and discipline those in whom have abused their authority in the church? 
It causes for us to be the laughingstock to the world. Humiliated. Because we look exactly like the world. So for someone coming into a local church, they can feel as if there is no discipline, no authority. And so we all just come to hear the preaching of the word of God and go home because they do not see discipline being exercised. But we all know what happens when there is a lack of discipline. There is no order. There's no change. We are living in the decline of the morality of the church right now. We have adopted as a local body a sense of enabling and a sense of allowing rather than, as theologian Greg Allison says, an embrace to enact discipline. But we hate that word. We hate that word discipline, if we're being honest. Because that word implies correction that we are wrong. But it also implies something else that we hate, confrontation. And with that confrontation, there's conflict. And with that conflict, there's truth and accountability. We don't like it. It doesn't give you the warm, fuzzy feeling to confront an individual. So. Tina, if we hate it, we don't do it. Because we are to be a nice church in the same way that the mother or father at home believes that they're being a nice parent by allowing their child to do whatever they want. Enabling and allowing. So if we hate it, we just, Carrie, don't do it. But if we don't enforce discipline, how can we honestly say that we love someone? How can we honestly say that we love someone if discipline isn't enacted nor embraced? Could it be, this is my challenge to the local body, could it be that we have forgotten how to love? Could it be in the homes we have forgotten how to love? Could it be in the local church we have forgotten how to love? As one seminary professor put it, the, the cruelest act of love is to leave someone in their sin while doing nothing. Did everybody just hear that? The cruelest act of love is to never confront Never say anything about it and leave someone in their sin. Because it demonstrates how you deal with your own sin. Because if I'm not dealing with my own sin, enacting discipline upon myself, then you don't feel the urge to do it for anyone else in the body of Christ. But the kindest thing we could ever do is to do everything that we can to get them out of sin. That is the kindest thing that we can do, to do everything possible to get someone out of sin. Because to neglect our duty, now watch this, to neglect our duty in church discipline please pay attention to this, is to imply that you know how to love the church better than Christ. It is to imply that you know how to love someone better than Christ. 
Because Christ disciplines those he loves. So when we don't embrace or enact discipline, we are telling a very terrifying story. We don't love you. We just don't. But what is church discipline? It should be here on the screen. As a part of the process of discipleship, that's the wrong slide, it is a divinely authoritative authority. It's, it is a divine authority delegated to the church by Jesus Christ to maintain order through the correction of unrepentant church members for the good of those caught in intentional sin and for the purity of the church to the glory of God. It is part of the process of discipleship. It is not something in which is mutually exclusive, but it is part of what it is that we do in helping us as a body look more like Christ. You guys follow me so far? But when we neglect it, I don't think we have thought through the ramifications of when we neglect church discipline. I think sometimes we treat church discipline as if in the New Testament we are witnessing for the first time that someone is being disciplined because of impurities or immoralities, rebellious sin. Well, if you look back in Joshua 7, the sin of Achan, and that he took the devoted things before the people of God were getting ready to march upon Ai. And victory wasn't given to them. So Joshua, along with the leaders, begin to tear their clothes and they're asking God, like, God, we're going into victory. We lost. You said that the land was ours. And he says, but there's someone in the camp that stole things that he wasn't supposed to steal, which brings forth discipline on the entire people of God. Well, if we know our Bible, you guys know what happened next? They confronted him. He was sorrowful. But he disobeyed God. They took the family outside the camp and they stoned Achan. Stoned him. Now, we ain't got no rocks up here. Don't worry. What happened in Genesis 3? What happened in the garden? The discipline. Adam and Eve sinned against God. There was discipline. Why? Because he loves them. But the aim of his discipline is the same aim of ours. Restoration. I don't think we understand that when we neglect church discipline, we are denying the holiness of Christ. Christ is holy, set apart, distinct from all things. But what happens is that when we neglect discipline, we look just like the world. We just fit on in. And what, it, what happens is that now it's a testimony against the holiness of Christ. So there is no exaltation. It's only just destroying the image of Christ. But when we neglect church discipline, it also hinders the purity and the unity of God's church. That essentially it's telling the world, we go for anything. Anything goes at the church. Anything that sounds immoral to the world that everybody's saying that, yes, you need to affirm, that's making its way into the church and it's contaminating. It's creating confusion. 
And it's, starting, it's not starting to, it damages the body of Christ. It destroys unity. And that unity under the headship of Christ and that unity that we are to maintain gets destroyed. Because now anything goes. I don't have to go and speak to my brother or sister in Christ. I could just leave the church. If someone offends me, I could just leave. I don't have to say anything. And being very destructive to the purity and the unity of the church. When we neglect church discipline, it hinders our witness to the world. It hinders our reverent reputation. Contaminates. But church discipline, ladies and gentlemen, it's an extension of love. It's an extension of love. Revelations 3, 19 says this, to those whom I love, he's talking about his people, I reprove, meaning that I convict. That means that it is brought before the individual. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, correcting and guiding. So be jealous and repent. That means now run after God. Run after him. It's like what Pastor Josh was preaching about last week. This is why membership is so important. Because we belong to Jesus Christ. So in belonging to Jesus Christ, he knows what type of discipline is necessary for his body. He knows. See, all of us have uh, maybe particular ailments, right? As we get older, you wake up in the morning, you turn the wrong way, and you're out for the week, right? Stretch, go try to get a pencil or a pen, and you're done, right? Well, we also know that when we get sick, there are certain medicines that maybe you can take and it does really well for you. But if I take it, it doesn't do really well for me. There are certain foods in which we eat. I don't know about you. I can't do milk anymore. All right. Can't do it. Can't do cheese anymore. All right. Don't hate on me. But it does something to my system. Right. Because what? It's my body. So I know what is best for my body. See, the other day, my wife and I, we were working out in our gym, and there's a particular trainer that she likes that I do not like. His name is Dan, okay? <laughs> Dan, he's on YouTube. All right, it's Tiff and Dan, all right? She loves Dan, but Dan doesn't properly warm you up. And so as a guy who's had three knee surgeries, I get in there, and Patty is ready to go, and I just give her kind of this stank eye. And I give her the stink eye because I'm like, my body is not like yours. I need a warm-up. I need a good warm-up because then if I don't get this proper warm-up, I'm done. And you know what happened? Old Dan blew my knee up. And so now I'm like walking around because I knew I was being a good husband that morning. But I knew what my body needed. Christ he knows his own. He knows the type of discipline that's necessary. And I'm going to tell you right now, it will go way beyond your feelings. Way beyond. But I know how it is. Maybe you think that discipline contradicts his other attributes. It doesn't. See, we have, we have great difficulty in seeing God's justice and God's righteous ways and love and mercy, we, we have a problem bringing that all together. See, that's why, for example, single parents, you have a very difficult job, very difficult, because it is difficult for a child to try to now parse through the different characteristics and attributes that you have. So in one moment, you're picking them up from school, and it was like a great time. You're the loving mom. You're the loving dad. But then you go home, you say, clean your room. And they don't want to clean your room. And then it's like, hey, look, I'm not going to clean your room for you. You need to clean. All of a sudden, there's a battle. Now you've got to raise your voice. Now when you raise your voice, you've gotten into that danger zone. And for some of your kids, they may try you. They may try to step to you. All right, I'm not going to have you repent right now. All right. 
But then at that point, like, you got to know you've crossed that line. And when you cross that line, hands may be put upon you. Blessed hands, <laughs> right? But hands may be put upon you. And then they go to sleep at night, and they're conflicted because they're like, how can you love me and yet at the same time discipline me? See, the nature and the characteristics of Christ, they don't contradict one another. See, the motivation behind discipline is love. That's the motivation. It's like what I used to tell my athletes. Be concerned when I stop talking to you. When I stop coaching you, then be concerned. Because now my attention has shifted away from you. Love is the motivation. Why? How can we understand it? Because God pursues what he loves. God pursues what he loves. And he pursues to restore. So in church discipline, when we confront, we pursue because we love. And no discipline feels pleasant at that time, but it will reap benefits. So, in conclusion, church discipline isn't optional. Parents, Discipline your children. It's not optional. Now, I'm not saying go ham and grow up how we used to grow up and get beat and punished because there was no aim of love and no motivation. It was, you made me upset and I'm going to make you feel this pain. If the aim is love and the motivation is love, then discipline isn't optional at all, then how should we love? Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 18 because Jesus is going to show us how to love. How should we love in light of church discipline? Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, and we're going to start with this first one. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother slash sister. So how should we love? Number one, with humble concern privately. With humble concern privately. Before we get ready to unpack this for a moment, I want us to think about what it says in Galatians 6, 1. In Galatians 6, 1, it says that you who are spiritual should restore in a spirit of what? Gentleness. So that we are not tempted as well. We, we guard ourselves against being prideful and we humbly and gently approach privately. This humble spirit of gentleness. If we go to Philippians 2, you don't have to turn there. You can put it down. Humility is when I consider the interest of others over myself. That means that I am considering that person's fellowship with God over my friendship with them. It's a process of discipleship. And I don't think it's preached like this often. I think it's preached as if it is something so totally different than what is supposed to occur daily with the church. See, this is a process of discipleship that begins privately before it becomes public. It's what we call due process. 
So, just so no one approaches me after the service, I am going to, from time to time in this service, because we have just had to enact church discipline on a former member several weeks ago. So I do not want to fool you and you think that I'm sending out little jabs here and there. I want to be very open about what I'm talking about today. This is why when the members who were there, when discipline was enacted, there was a timeline. And if anybody could remember in that timeline, I said these were the private moments and we were patient and in those private moments, it was over a year before it became public. I share that with you because we are accountable. It's due process. That means that during a year, you are innocent until proven guilty. You work with the individual. Due process because I think that once we get to that point where the church has now been brought in because it is now public, for some, you may be thinking that's the first act. No, that's the very last act. It's desperation at that point. It's desperation at that point. It is not the first act. It is the last, please repent. It's, it's no different than when your child ends up in the principal's office. When your child ends up in the principal's office because of their behavior and they get suspended, that was the last step. Because what should have happened is that we, as parents, should have been holding them accountable at home. And when it is not addressed privately in a process of discipleship, it becomes public, and now something has to be done. Why do I keep saying the process of discipleship? It's because we are, as a church, accountable when an individual gets to that last stage because that means a lot of people did not say anything. So what happens is that a person goes through a year, year and a half, but if your only community is on Sunday, you'll never know. You'll never know what they stand for. You'll never know what they're talking about. You just keep having breakfasts and lunches. You just want to go hang out with them. But all underneath, there is something that is seeking to undermine the unity of the body of Christ. And it could be your friend. It could be the person sitting next to you. Could be your mama. Could be your son. Could be your daughter. But will you put your friendship in front of their fellowship with Christ? And so what happens is if, if you are just a church attender, then what happens is that you're hindering the ability for individuals to be corrected before it gets to a place in which the church now has to be notified. That means that we got to catch it at home. That means we got to catch it in community. But a lot of us don't catch it, and we see somebody, and we're just like, man, if we just see him on Sunday, man, that Will is a nice guy. Man, he's always hugging people. He's always got a smile on his face because you don't know me. And so all of a sudden, if you see me in front of people, now I'm being disciplined. It looks really bad. But then I would ask, where were you in the process of discipleship? What small group were you in to hear some of the nonsense? What team were you a part of where you could hear those things? Because right at that point, now it is on you. At that point, think about it. You have an opportunity at that point to keep someone the best way that you can from having to come to the last stage. You've got an opportunity. But in those moments, I get it. You're like, Ah, uh, you know, confrontation is really not my thing. Love isn't optional. If you love someone, then you do that. That's where, for example, there may be individuals here at this church who left during that time, but never even came to any of us to talk about why they felt the way they felt and allow for us to even talk about such things. 
Love is an optional. Love is confrontational. Love is restorative. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, the Apostle Paul says we need to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Did you see that? Eager. My God, let me tell you this. I... <laughs> I grew up in drama. How many of you guys grew up in drama? And I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not talking about the class, okay? When you grow up in drama, you know what's the last thing you want to do? Be in drama. You know the last thing you want to do? Confront somebody. You know the last thing you want to do? Make someone mad. That's the last thing you want to do. But it's like I said a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to better articulate it here. It's not that we should love to discipline. It's that discipline is birthed from love. So I discipline because I love. I don't love to discipline. But the Bible says we must be eager to maintain the unity. Eager means that if you have an issue, he said privately, go. Go. Even if you're uncomfortable, even if you don't know what to say. Even for you, like, you may have never reconciled with anybody in your life. If you just want to sit there and just like, I'm just going to vent. This is how I feel. Well, it's a start. It's a start. Look, I've gotten pulled into offices before and people cuss me out. They still just church. Cuss me out and you find out it's a misunderstanding. Or I've had an individual that had something against me for uh, about four years because of something that I said to my wife during a sermon. You know me, I kid around. My jokes don't always fly. <laughs> and it just happened to be a particular Sunday. The joke didn't fly. And so this woman in our church held it against me for four years. And I didn't find out until the end. And she was just, <laughs> I still remember it, you know. I held you so high in your character, but you're here right in the middle. And I'm like, why? Because of how you addressed your wife that day. I was like, yeah, she like, in the middle of me preaching, delivered a note from the AV in the middle of me preaching. Like, come on now, you don't do that. That's what she held against me. And it grew. Because now, when it grows, any little thing can set you off. Because when that bitterness isn't addressed, now you become repulsive. Now when you, somebody hears you talk, it's like, I don't even want to hear you talk anymore. And the, the whole time, I have no clue. No clue. So that means I can't grow as a pastor. Can't grow my leadership. But when we get to this point right here at the very beginning, what I'm saying is, and I'm, I'm harping on this point because if we can understand how important small groups are, if we can understand how important it is to get to know the individuals that you are with, we can help to save souls. I love what Warren Wiersbe says. He says, it's, it's, it's not about winning an argument. It's about winning a brother. It's about winning a brother. So how do we love? We humbly, with humble concern privately, and number two, with humble concern collectively. Verse 16. And it says this. It says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. This is an allusion to Deuteronomy chapter 19. You can look, at this, look, at this, uh, look this up. Um, after the sermon, but what you're seeing is that you're seeing civil matters that are being dealt with in principle. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you bring two or three, you bring your mob, you know, you bring your gang right from the very beginning. No, you go and address it privately. Now in addressing that privately, now what's happened is that the individual has been unrepentant, okay? Watch where this goes because this is extremely important. From that point, you've got to understand 
that even though you may have brought to one person a particular sin, that doesn't mean you were actually accurate. You could be misinterpreting something. So just because you brought it and they didn't repent, maybe it was your presentation. Maybe it was the fact that you took a branch or a leaf issue and you turned it into a trunk issue. Okay? So before we start running to the part of that person's wrong, I love how these mechanisms are already set up in the body of Christ through the Spirit. That the next thing you do is you talk to qualified people, not to gossip, because the aim is what? No matter what, love, restoration, okay? So that means qualified conversations, mature individuals, okay? Not those individuals who will tell you, like, let's ante up, all right? No. You want to talk to qualified individuals, individuals that you know are in the Word and will point you back to the Word and tell you that you are wrong. So they are not there, essentially, because they were at the scene of the crime. And they were not there because they saw evidence of sin in this person's life. They're there to confirm that your cause is right to pursue. It's a protective measure for the integrity of the church because we can't just be running after everything. There are certain things in which me and Josh, we've had this moment before. Josh was upset about something. This was years ago. And I told him to take his time, told him to pray about certain things, but he didn't go and start gossiping around the church. He knew that we're going to be prayerful, we're going to be considerate, and we're going to be biblical. And then what happened was down the line, he was able to move forward gently, humbly, because there was issue in what he had thought about this person. And he's doing the same thing for me nowadays as well. But there's also something in this. Some of you have come from churches where leaders are not held accountable. This goes for leaders as well. But it's a little different. Because it says here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two to three witnesses. So what does that mean? Because you have to understand, as an elder pastor, we get, we're confronted with things all the time, okay? There's not a day that goes by that I didn't do something wrong, okay? So we get that all the time. But now when you're talking about an elder being in sin, as opposed to me going to the elder, I'm getting ready to bring a serious charge. Sin is serious. And so I got to really sit down. I got to talk. Hey, Pastor Will, you know, I saw him doing this, saw him doing that. You know, well, and they're going to, and they should ask, like, where at? Like, what were you doing there? You know? <laughs> but there needs to be two or three to make sure that this is a charge you're going to pursue because if you don't handle that right, you'll turn a pastor against a congregation. But when it is individuals who sit down, and they point something out, you get an opportunity as a pastor to repent. But in a lot of churches, the congregation doesn't have that power, nor they have that authority, even though it says it biblically that you do. You know what that does? That protects us against Will and Josh and Jimmy ever going in the direction of pride to where people in the congregation have the authority to pursue the cause based upon our sinful characteristics. When we get to this point collectively, we want to be prayerful. We got to be pursuant, right? And pursuant of the biblical aim. Not trying to prove a person right. And we got to be patient. The thing about this particular passage, Matthew 18, it doesn't give a timeline, does it? doesn't give a timeline. And so I pray that you're patient because sometimes, I don't know about you, uh, but maybe you were that blessed person that got it the first time. Uh, for me, uh, there were some things I didn't get to the 20th time. And so you got to be patient. You got to be prayerful before you get ready to go to other levels. 
So how do we love? Number three, with humble concern congregationally. You guys still with me? Verse 17, it says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So now we've gotten to a place where the private matter has now become public. If you're, if you're like me and you pull back from the scripture, you get a sense of what's really happening. And, and I, I pray that we get this. For those who were there that day, and this not being the first time in which we've had a break of intimate fellowship with one person, it's not the first time. Maybe it's the first time some of you were involved in that. But what you should have felt and what I felt in the room, it was somber. There was grieving, wasn't it? There was mourning, wasn't it? Hold that. Okay, the teens say, I do this all the time. They're like, what are you holding here? <laughs> Hold that. Because that's how serious sin is. It's a picture of what's to come. He's giving us a judicial picture of judgment. But this person has an opportunity to repent. But if they don't feel the somber, if they don't feel that, if they don't see the tears, if, there's not, if that's not there, then we've given them a false representation of the final judgment. See, everything is unto the glory of God. He gives us all these little mechanisms within the church to reveal his nature and his character. And what is he doing? He's like, I love you so much. I'm layers upon layers. Stop. No, you're rebelling against me. Stop. No, you're rebelling against me. Because there's going to be a day where you can't repent. And I've got to show you how serious sin is. So for some of us, we, we've utilized sin in a way which we look at it kind of as a severe and not so severe. Sin is sin. You'll die from it spiritually, physically, we die from it. Think about it. We die because of natural sin that was caused by moral sin. Our unbelief against God created the death, the strife, the pain, the affliction. And so he's giving us a picture of what it's going to be, a somber moment before the judge. If it's not that... And somebody doesn't treat their sin as serious, then they never get a clear picture. We could be the reason why we're muddying up the picture for people because now hell don't sound real. It's the final stage. And he's saying, I have created church discipline to restore you, to bring you back. Some of you may be tempted to say, well, you know, what sins necessitate church discipline? That sounds like my son. You know, like, how can I get away with something without, you know, finding the loopholes? Can I challenge you in this? Because we could be here all day with this, okay? Do not pay attention to the severity of the sin because sin is already severe, okay? Pay attention to the posture of the worshiper towards sin. Pay attention to the posture of the worshiper towards sin. Because you think that they're being unresponsive to you. They're being unresponsive to the Spirit. You think that they're being unrepentant to you. They're being unrepentant to God. Now watch this. Now the more unresponsive I get, the more darkened I get in my heart, the more that my heart begins to calcify and I'm rejecting all the people in whom God has sent as a means of grace. What's starting to happen now 
is that now you have become unidentifiable. That now you have gotten to a place where you are identified by your sin and not identified by the Son or the Spirit. So publicly, we got an issue because your outward actions are projecting upon the people that you don't follow Jesus Christ. And so it's more so gravitating to sin and not lordship. But I get it. We don't like this either because now it sounds like we're judging, right? All right. <laughs> How many of you guys used to listen to Tupac? Some of you guys still do. Raise your hand. You guys are lying. If it's only three, four people, you're lying. You're lying. But he said something. He said, only God can judge me. And some of y'all then got that tatted on your back or on your forearm. Some of you took that and didn't read the Bible. I want to turn real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, 13. I'll get there before you do. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 through 13, he says this. Apostle Paul, because you know what's happening in the church in Corinth? The church leaders and the congregation are not embracing or enacting church discipline when a son was sleeping with his stepmom. And the church did nothing. And it became public. And now there has to be a public decision made. So obviously it's upsetting people in the church. But this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. So Pac was right. He judges those on the outside. Purge the evil person from among you. This is how we are to judge. And it's a different judge than what you think. Because our judgment is declarative, not definite. We do not hold the keys for divine, eternal uh, destination. Amen? We don't. We have declarative power, meaning what has already been stated in the word of God. That's what type of power we have. It's under the headship of Christ. So what does that mean? That also means, Steve, that we don't know a person's heart. We can't see inside their heart. We cannot sit here and tell you with 100% proof you are saved. We can only go by the actions of the individual. Now watch where I'm going here. That means we judge the outside of the inside. So we judge the outside, the fruit inside the church, not outside. And so that's why it's important with membership. Because if an individual is not a member, and when I say a member, a participating member of the church, how are we then to enact discipline? They're an outsider. And so we want to make sure that we're not in sin with that as well. So that means that within, we judge the outside, but we're not to judge non-believers or non-members. Well, how does this look? It's really easy. In families, mom or dad will say, son or daughter, stop hanging around with Sakari and Tiffany, okay? <laughs> yep, but watch where I'm going with this. I don't have authority, hypothetically speaking, over Tiffany or Sakari, but I have authority over my own. So when I tell my son or my daughter, or you tell your son or daughter not to hang out with them, what we're saying is that we have authority from inside with those who belong, not those outside. We would look crazy trying to discipline someone else's child, right? <laughs> You'll go to jail. <laughs> but my son, he understands, he understands this, 
very clear this declarative authority because he did it this morning. So he came upstairs and he said, Mommy, he said that Gabby is not making me a smoothie this morning. And so my wife said to him, Son, you can go downstairs and you can tell her that Mommy said, you know, would you make Lucas a smoothie? He was like, thank you. Mommy said, make me a smoothie. <laughs> he didn't possess that type of authority. He only had authority as long as he was aligned with what Mama said. And so for us, uh, it's a humble concern congregationally because we're now on that last step of excommunication. Now, don't let this word mess you up. When you think of excommunication, someone being put out, and this is where membership or participation, all these things start coming together. You ready? Is that it puts you out of what is shared and common within the community. Well, hold on now. You see how church membership is participation? Because if nobody's participating in anything and we're just attending, Church discipline really probably has never been enacted in a church. So what does that mean? That means when you hear someone like myself say, breaking away from intimate fellowship. I'm sure that confused the heck out of you. I did a poor job that day of backing that up with what intimate fellowship was, but Pastor Josh saved me the next week and went through that. Intimate fellowship, you know what that means? That means that when we read in the scriptures about fellowship, not hanging out, get that out of your mind. When we talk about intimate fellowship, we're talking about when we eat meals together and take part in communion. That a person is excommunicated in regards to the participation of what is shared in common within the community. So that means that until that person is repented, they do not partake of the Lord's Supper. Now I pray that it begins to make sense that when we had a... We had a disciplinary moment. I kept bringing up communion. I was like, you were having communion with us. And I said that the person had not thought this out. What else does this mean? That means that they are removed from membership. But membership, if you're not participating, doesn't mean anything. It could just mean attending. It's not what they're talking about here. It's excommunication from those things that are shared, intimate fellowship, those things in which we participate in serving one another. But one thing they are not, and, and, and watch where I'm going with this, because every situation is very tricky. It does, it's not a one-size-fit-all, okay? They are not kicked out of attending church. They're not. They're not. Now, there are, like in certain situations, like the person in whom we were dealing with, they went to go plant another church that really wasn't a church. It's different. But if we have an individual that if this happens again in the future, maybe it's a different situation. We do not want to prevent them from attending church. We don't want to prevent them from being loved. But our conversation will change because now you are not demonstrating the qualities of a brother or sister in Christ. So now we go from edification to evangelizing you. Now we're actually trying to reach you because you've departed and you're lost. And so we want them to continue to keep attending church so that they can hear the word of God being preached. We want them to attend so that we can stay within the process of restoration. We can't help it if somebody leaves, but if someone has the right spirit and sticks around, then we owe them our kindness. We owe them our love. Because we've had individuals that are here right now who have, who have experienced discipline and who are thriving members in this church. Why? Because we surrounded them. And when they wanted to leave, we said, stay attending. But... I'm being very careful with my words here. If we were to remove someone from attending church, it's because of safety. Safety. So if we were to find out that someone was molested, if we were to find out that someone was stealing 
um, <laughs> like going beyond and becomes criminal activity, then we have to come together as a church and decide, like, we can't have this person here. I had that happen. That was my first, <laughs> that was my first duty as a senior pastor to excommunicate the former pastor and his family. Why? Because the environment was unsafe. It was unsafe to allow him and his family to stay would have been unsafe for the congregation and himself because there were people in a church that were coming to church to kill him, literally. So you don't just like, well, Matthew 18 says this. Well, there's a reason why in 1 Corinthians 5, that the Apostle Paul skipped everything because the situation became public. And in that particular situation, it was public right now. And things had to happen. So even to this day, that particular pastor has not repented. And I've shared this with Josh. He has not repented. He has not even confessed his sin. And if I, this is the responsibility that I have, that if I were to hear that he's pastoring somewhere here in the city, I have a duty to show up and tell him to resign. Because he has not repented. But this excommunication, I think something we don't look at, it protects our weaker members. The ones who are naive, the ones who are shallow in their faith. Because if that person continues, you could lead other people astray. So we treat them as a non-believer, a non-brother, not hated, and we evangelize because the soul is that important. And lastly, how should we love? With humble concern, restoratively. With humble concern, restoratively. I'm going to read here out of the Amplify because it makes a little bit more sense here. Well, no, I'll stay here. I'll go in verse 18. It says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he says, let me keep going. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am amongst them. I love what it says here, though, in the Amplified. It says that whatever you bind. Now watch this, because a lot of people I hear always binding and loosening. I'm like, y'all know what y'all binding and loosening. Whatever you bind, that means, now watch this, okay, because this scripture is about church discipline. It is not, okay, about two or three gathered, and now we have a church. What it is, is that it's showing us triunity. God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, harmony. So two or three are gathered. We are a reflection of that triune harmony because God brings us together to be able to not only make a decision in regards to what is unlawful, but that which is lawful. So it says, whatever you bind, meaning forbid, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth, will have already been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose, basically what you permit, what you declare to be lawful on earth, will have already been loosed in heaven. Oh, this is very important. This means that heaven is speaking, so that when we enact church discipline, this is, this is wild here. That means that the Spirit of God has preceded the action, because what is being done in the natural is, is a manifestation of what has happened in the heavenlies. It's not that we're just doing it just to be doing it. It is a spiritually discerned action here. When I bind, it's a divine indictment. Person is excommunicated in relationship to what the Word of God says. But then we have the restorative aspect, the loosening. There's divine forgiveness. The soul is on the line. You know, that looks like it's formal. That means it's not somebody coming up to a pastor and saying, I think they're ready. No, this is a church decision. We made a church decision in regards to excommunication. It is a church decision in regards to restoration. That's where it goes back to the process of discipleship because you have every right to say, well, who's been discipling this person? Who's been meeting with this person? Because they're going to have to vouch. They're going to have to vouch. So that means that that person would come and there would be, it would be a time of affirming and we would vote. And we would vote. 
And we would hope that that brother and sister, that they would repent and we would celebrate. That we would celebrate because why? The aim is restoration. The aim is love. It's no different than what we see in the prodigal son. The prodigal son came home. And what did the father do? (sighs) He ran to him, wrapped the robe around him, slaughtered the fattened calf, put a ring on his finger. My son who was lost is now found. So with the same intensity that we have with excommunication, restoration better far exceed it. It better be a party going on. Because the Bible says they're celebrating in heaven. So if they're celebrating in heaven and we just like, oh, great, we got a brother restored, we missing it. So hold me accountable to that. All right. Because when a brother's restored, you know, Steve going to start the barbecue up at his house because he wants to show you his new smoker. (laughs) But that agreement that we have, it's judicial. It's not just we get to ask for anything. That agreement is judicial. It means that we're seeking God's will. It means that it affirms Jesus's presence because Jesus's presence is meant to bring us back to him. So look. We have a 5013C, our 501C3 board. It's very formal. There's a book that goes along with anybody who's a part of boards. And there's a way in which you go about it, right? There's certain words that you have to use. Vivian knows how much we struggle in those meetings, right? Praise God for William Morris, Pastor John, Jimmy helping us out. But the Bible isn't a rule book. It's not. There is no perfect way to administer church discipline. It's not. Each time that it's administered here, we learn something new. But our authority is a delegated authority in Christ. Jesus is perfectly, perfectly definitive in his judgments. We're only declarative. We're just revealing God's will in the Holy Scriptures. But we as a church, and this is important, we as a church here at ECV, we're a church of sinners. We're a church of sinners, saved by grace, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ. You know what that means, David? We may not get disciplined right all the time. And I'll tell you right now, it'll happen in the future, and we're not going to get it right there either. It's not going to be perfect. However, when we come together, instead of being separate and talking about it in side talk, when we can actually come together, under his headship, he'll show us how to love properly. He'll show us how to love properly. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To stream more of our past video sermons, please check out our YouTube channel or our website at endurancechurch.com. You can also learn more about our church, our various ministries, and how you can get involved. Again, Our website is endurancechurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line anytime at info at endurancechurch.com. God bless you, and thanks for being part of our online service today.